say goodbye to IBS forever with my foolproof three-step plan. And did you know IBS affects 15% of the global population and it also classes as a disability under the Equalities Act 2010. And for those of you who watch until the end of the video, you'll get a lovely little bonus step to our ultimate guide to beating IBS. First, what is IBS and why should you care? IBS stands for Irritable Bowel Syndrome and it crosses over with IBD, Irritable Bowel Disease. And the exact cause of IBS is unknown. IBS can be debilitating. It's had a chokehold on my life for the past three years. Although I fixed my IBS naturally through my three-step process, but the bonus step had the most impact. And these four things are the best thing that I've ever done for myself. When I compare my inflammation, stomach pain, and overall happiness and wellness now, compared to six months ago, I would never have imagined I could have made such a change. It's been life changing. And the chronic nature of IBS can lead to anxiety, depression, leading to a reduction in the quality of life. And like I said, in taking these steps that you're about to hear about, I'm pleased to say that I'm out the other side, and I just hope that I can help you make that change. But knowing how much happier I am now, I can definitely say my IBS certainly had an impact on my mental health and well-being. In summary, IBS is relatively horrific, awkward and debilitating, if I haven't said that already. My three steps plus bonus step are linked to solving IBS symptoms. And in order to help you map the symptoms, the successful steps I'll discuss later in the video. I'm going to run through a bunch of symptoms before we start, and I want to hear from you below as to which ones that you've experienced. Maybe a viewer has also experienced that symptom and can give you some advice. We're going to start with the least severe of symptoms and work our way up to the most embarrassing and painful of symptoms. So in at number five, is acid reflux. According to the United Kingdom's National Health Service, IBS has a substantial overlap with acid reflux. And I've struggled with acid reflux from roughly the age of 14 or 15 years old. And through my steps, I've enjoyed the last five months without these symptoms. And acid reflux is my least debilitating symptom, as it was the most ignorable out of all of them. Plus Rennie's and Gaviscon really, really worked. But I was fed up with buying them and carrying them around. It costs so much, it's ridiculous. And in at number four are the generic abdominal pains and cramping. Very common in those that struggle with IBS. Thankfully, I didn't struggle with cramps, but I certainly had pain on the surface of the stomach. The sensation of fullness to the point of pain whenever I ate something. Really annoying, really, really painful. Even when I hadn't stuffed myself and eaten healthily. And in at number three is the sensation of incomplete evacuation. I think that was the best way of putting it. Couldn't explain it any differently, but it's when you leave the toilet still feeling you haven't finished. One of the worst feelings, because in my case, as I had aggressive IBS, I really couldn't leave the house until I felt I was fully finished. So that meant more trips to the loo. But I wanted to point out the psychological impacts here, because when you've got a job, you've got to be in the office at a certain time, you really, really can't get out of the house. And you don't want to describe what's going on to your colleagues it's kind of embarrassing then you know it's a sticky situation and it makes you worried and an anxious about things but that's what i hope you watch until the end of the video because if any of you have felt like that i've certainly been there and now i've got that completely covered and i want you feeling the same way that i feel now and symptom number two is bloating an easy second place because of the amount it's been taken practically every single bloody meal. Healthy food, bloating. Crap food, bloating. Halfway food, bloating. Everything just led to bloating. Besides the pain from the bloating and the evidential abdominal pain, burps are uncontrollable. Constantly stifling burps at the dinner table. It's not comfortable, not nice. It's also pretty poorly mannered. In some cultures, I think it's accepted, but awkward, unmannerly and uncomfortable is bloating. But it's another thing I fixed in my four step process and so make sure you watch until the end of the video. And finally, in at the most debilitating of symptoms from my perspective with fairly aggressive IBS was the alternating bowel movements and diarrhea. I'm always someone who goes to the loo and does their number twos in the morning and rarely the rest of the day. But when my IBS starts to pick up, my mornings were wrecked by the number of times I needed to go to the loo because of one of the sensations of incomplete evacuation and it all spiralled from there. It was horrific. I was often on the loo for four or five times a morning before I could even feel comfortable before leaving the house. Not comfortable at all. And getting to the office at a decent time was impossible because I never knew when the next 
sensation of needing to go to the loo was coming around the corner. I'd often have left for work and then within two minutes of leaving the house and locking the door, need it again. Very awkward stuff. Like I said, I fixed it now. Now the steps are coming soon, I promise. But the final aspect of IBS that I want to cover are their potential triggers. This is important because you need to be aware of all of them. Because like I found, the start of IBS can be caused by absolutely anything. And you never know when you're going to develop a new symptom. And if you've got the knowledge that I'm about to explain to you, at least then you'll be the slightest bit prepared for it. Or at least aware of it. So you can steer yourself in a different direction, which I definitely recommend doing. But if you're already struggling with these symptoms, then this is even more important. One of the common causes of IBS is stress, which had a part to play in the start of my IBS, alongside the next trigger, which is diet. I used to eat ready meals, takeaways, cookies, and donuts from the bakery sections, thinking my cycling would work it off. No, wrong again. Cycling hard wasn't enough. Cycling hard for a good hour and a half to two hours most of the time. I really needed to understand what was going wrong with my diet. My understanding and thoughts around the takeaways and the ready meals was that it would be food that I cook at home anyway. But no, again, Alex, try again. That's where all the rubbish is, in the ready meals and the takeaways. Particularly ready meals, where they make gums and additives, they increase its consistency, fill up its volume. It's horrible. I'm going to leave a couple of links in the description down below. There's this one episode on YouTube actually shows the making of home brand mayonnaise and it is it's horrible that's the stuff that's causing the obesity and it's certainly the stuff in my case because that's the one factor in my 25 years of living that i haven't stopped doing and i have been doing that for the past five months and it's working and i love it with diet i also say gut health and have you ever heard of the gut brain axis because this is key to understand the mental health side of ibs and then one of the other triggers spicy and fatty foods which are the most common triggers for most people and would often set me off very badly which is unfortunate because my girlfriend's indonesian it mainly consists of spicy foods fatty foods like pork and beef which i still love but this and all the other triggers are different for each person there's certainly some commonality among sufferers now i've provided you with a solid base of understanding ibs whether you're watching this and have never heard of it but more likely, if you're watching this because you suffer with IBS, I hope I've provided some value to you already. Please let me know what resonated most with you so far in the video down in the comment section below. I promise I'll reach out to all comments. Let me know if there's any other triggers that I've missed out. And with enough interest, I'll make IBS triggers my next video. So without further ado, let's jump into this three-step plan. Step one in the journey to beating IBS is fermented foods. The reason why fermented foods are so good at fixing IBS is because it helps fix any gut imbalances, which is related to the trigger diet and gut health that I spoke about earlier. Now this is obviously within reason. You can't just eat fermented foods and you can't eat tons of it. There needs to be a balance. But fermented foods can do this as they have a prebiotic effect that nourishes existing gut microbes to help them thrive. And this is all related to the gut brain axis I mentioned earlier. According to the National Institute for Health, the gut-brain axis is a bi-directional communication network that links the enteric and central nervous system. Right, a few bits of science jargon to decode there. Bi-directional, two ways. Enteric nervous system basically consists of a mesh-like system of neurons that govern the function of the gastrointestinal tract and is one of the three main divisions of the autonomic nervous system autonomic nervous system well it's a component of the peripheral nervous system that regulates processes such as heart rate blood pressure respiration digestion and even sexual arousal and the central and peripheral nervous system is the one that lies outside our brains and the spinal cord hence being referred to as the gut brain axis having diverted there i want to bring it back to the fermented foods quickly according to green nutrition Fermented foods have been associated with strengthening the gut's mucosal lining, or otherwise known as the leaky gut, as well as supporting the immune system. Now, in 2018, a randomized double blind trial demonstrated a significant reduction in IBS severity after six weeks of sauerkraut consumption. Two tablespoons or 23 grams of sauerkraut classified as a low FODMAP diet. 
There was also a randomised double blind placebo controlled study a couple of years ago. We found that regular kimchi consumption led to significant improvements in IBS symptoms, stool frequency, stool consistency, and gut microbiota composition. A third of a cup of kimchi of 47 grams is considered a low FODMAP diet. Kimchi and sauerkraut are one of my favourites. The sour bread is also one of my favourites. Studies suggest sourdough consumption can enrich beneficial gut bacteria while reducing symptoms like bloating. Now, kefir and yogurt. Scientific findings suggest that kefir may alleviate constipation in individuals with IBS-C. The constipation aspect of IBS. If an individual is lactose intolerant, you can add kefir to the yogurt to help keep symptoms at bay. UPFs and PFs. What the hell are they? PFs are processed foods. And the U stands for ultra. UPFs in particular have been implicated in adverse gut outcomes like alterations to gut microbial communities and intestinal permeability. This leads to chronic inflammation and diseases like IBS and IBD. Amongst a good proportion of the scientific community is the belief that consumption of UPFs and the vastness of its inclusion in people's everyday diet is the main cause of today's obesity. And I believe that too, at least for my makeup. Being a full sports scholar at school and an academy rugby player and a national swimmer with many medals, I ran a major calorie deficit every single day of my life for the most part, yet I remained fat with love handles and man boobs. A common factor each day were the UPFs, like cookies and chocolate bars I get after training. UPFs are made up of additives like emulsifiers, colours and preservatives, like gums that are congealed in the lab. New research shows that there's an 8% higher risk of IBS symptoms, with every 10% increment of UPF consumption. And over the past five and a half months, I've been aiming for UPF consumption to be less than 15% of my total calorie consumption for the week. And it's been really easy. That's the best part of it. It's helped me lose 17 kilograms, but also aids my maintenance of energy throughout the day. There's so much more science behind this, and I'm not the person to tell you the specifics, but I've left my references in the description below. But interestingly enough, this step doesn't matter as much, and you can almost completely ignore this step if you get the next step right. But I'm not saying disregard it. Now the third step is plant diversity, meaning eat more of the good stuff rather than eating less of everything else in the needless pursuit for a calorie deficit, and ultimately denying the gut bacteria the diversity in food that they need to thrive in. Simply put, eat a ton of plants. I'm not saying you have to become plant-based or stuff your face. I'm not saying that at all. Although me personally, I am kind of sliding in that direction a little bit. When scientists refer to plant with regard to food, they mean your fruits and your vegetables, of course. They also mean your spices, your nuts, your seeds, and your legumes. Now, legumes are a funny one, but they're things like chickpeas, butter beans, kidney beans, black beans, all of that good stuff. Something that would make a really good chili con carne. The best bit about this step is the fiber, helping your body digest and process the food in your gut when we already struggle with it because we've got IBS. The best thing about legumes is that they're packed for the protein, so you don't need to worry about that. The important thing is, is that with every single meal, you divide the plate in three. I'm gonna move to the side here and show you a little example here as I talk you through it. Now, imagine a plate, half that plate, then half the top half of that plate, and that's your template. Now, what we want up here is the protein, then the carbohydrates, and then the gut enriching parts down here. I'm going to give two examples here for context. But I also want to hear your examples in the comment section down below. So take my lead with my examples and then join the conversation. Now my ideal plate, if food was no object, would be steak, chips, and maybe a mixed salad. But my ideal plate, after learning and implementing the basis for this channel, would be wild salmon, chickpea salad, and a roasted vegetable mix. Things like carrots, onions, tender stem broccoli, oregano, thyme, sage, olive oil, lemon or lime, and some paprika maybe a bit of garlic. Now the difference in quality of carbohydrates and fats between the two plates is ridiculous. The difference in diversity of food between the two plates is even more impressive. If I had the first option, I would have consumed a ton of saturated fats from the steaks, some processed, store-bought frozen chips, see the video in the description for how they're made, a mixed salad that would maybe have had two, absolutely max, three portions of plant in it. Whereas the second option, I would have consumed some of the best unsaturated fats from the wild salmon, with a ton of protein. I'll also get additional protein and a serious amount of fiber from the chickpeas and the roasted vegetable mix. And these are all high quality carbohydrates as well. The second option would have close to six or seven portions of plant rather than the two or three. 
the other plate. That's what's meant when someone discusses plant diversity. And now for the bonus step, and I cannot stress this enough because it's a step that fixed my IBS the fastest, is how I based my gut health improvements. All the other steps are important, but in my opinion, from my own experience with IBS, apple cider vinegar was the single biggest contributor that helped me fix it. I was genuinely amazed by it and so, so grateful that I finally found a product, as simple as it is, that when consumed every single day, it would actually fix my IBS. It would fix my trip to the blues. But the most important thing is that it fixed my bloating and my abdominal pain because they were non-existent. There are so many health benefits of apple cider vinegar. I genuinely believe that everyone with IBS needs to be taking this stuff. The best thing is that it's really cheap as well. I started by consuming my apple cider vinegar as soon as I woke up every single morning. And it was good for a little bit because it gave me a kick in the morning to wake up. And like I said, the biggest difference that I found was the reduced bloating, reduced appetite and also maintained energy levels throughout the day due to its ability to improve blood sugar control. If you're going to start consuming apple cider vinegar, there are a few things you need to be aware of before you start. After all, it is an acid. Where an individual has previous health issues, then you should definitely consult your doctor. Don't just listen to me, please. Also, make sure to leave it at least 30 minutes, preferably 45 minutes before you clean your teeth, which is why I've started taking it in the evening. There's a video to come on my channel soon where I'm going to discuss the benefits of taking it in the morning versus the benefits of taking it in the evening. But there is so much more to this stuff. Apple cider vinegar. And because it was that game changing for me, I reached out to Willie's actually and just said, look, this product has been game changing for me. I've struggled with IBS. I've got many, many other gut health issues and they were more than happy to have me on board as an affiliate. which You get a link in the description down below. But there's a completely separate video that I've published already, which you can see here. The main thing is that you now have my three-step blueprint and a video to click through on to satisfy your apple cider vinegar queries.